Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 142 for Wednesday, November 29th, 2017. Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How's it going, Dave? It goes. Crazy week, but I, I think they all are. So It's that time of year. Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. I'll I mean, in addition, to our, in addition to your regular craziness, there's, right. a, there's a seasonal craziness. It is. It screws up your schedule. It screws up uh, everything. But but it also, you know, it's it can be a good time of year, too. In fact, it in many ways, it's a good time of year. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we got on, on deck for today, my friend? I got a couple of things I want to talk about. Okay. I, the first one is really interesting. So we haven't had this conversation almost three years of doing this. It has worked its way into several conversations, but has never been the center of a conversation with us. Uh-oh. And I think it would be. Well, I think it's going to be really useful. And it is the mystical, mysterious ethereal concept of volume. <laughs> I just, I just want to like hold it up to the light in every way. And one of the reasons this came up, came about is, you know, I did a gig, I did, I did these petty gigs, uh, mm-hmm. Tom Petty tributes. And I played with a couple of guys who I haven't played with in the past. That's, that's where you start to really become aware of how different volume can be. And, you know, on stage when you're, you know, when you're playing with the same band all the time, you have whatever you complain about. But it's like, you know, you're used to it. Well, and and you have said when you played with us, how loud you thought the house rockers were. And Definitely. I've been thinking about that ever since you said it. So well, let's see if we can weave these things into some kind of practical conversation that uh, that can help everybody. Here's a couple observations. I, I, I have to start this, though, because I'm going to say a lot of things that are going to be exactly opposite to this fundamental truth. I'm a drummer and therefore I'm guilty. Uh, well, I mean, I'm a guitar player and therefore I'm accused. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> so, but I will say this, just watching, you know, this, this drummer who I hadn't played with before set up with me and he started setting up and testing his drums and sound checking his drums. And I could tell he was, he was going to be louder than what I expected him to be. Now, interestingly, we played the, the same group played an outdoor gig. To, we did three of the petty gigs. The first one was an outdoor gig. Right. And uh, it was interesting. That one was like sublimely wonderful volume. And that could have been that could have been, you know, people holding back. It could have been a few things. But here we are, the third gig. But it's indoor. also outdoors. Drums. Yep. Drums are a very different thing, uh, especially drums. Every instrument is sound is different indoors versus outdoors. But drums, especially because they, there really is no, like your amp, is, especially if you have a closed back amp, like it's very directional, you know, in terms of, of where the sound goes. With drums, the sound, it doesn't go quite in a sphere, but it goes out every side and front and top of, sure. of that instrument. Then that's sure. true of the cymbals. It's true of everything. And if you've got reflective surfaces behind and above you, in addition, to, of course, to underneath you, which is sort of unavoidable, although if you put a rug down, it helps, um, then that sound becomes, it. you know, it's like the room becomes an amplifier and makes the drums potentially like three or four times as loud as they would be outside. Yep. Right. So, so actually pause right there, because that's the first point is I'm watching a guy set up and hitting his drums. Now, this is a dynamic that I think is fairly universal. The inclination when you're setting up is to find volumes that dawn on you are right for the room, right? Yeah, totally. Everybody kind of, everybody kind of fiddles, you know, drummers fiddle their touch, um, you know, guitar players fiddle their, their, their volumes, you know, everybody is making some kind of subjective, uh, decision as to how much is enough for well, that room. Everybody should be. I, I've played with people that have no concept of this, by the way. See, I so. would say I would say that that's not right. Not everybody should be. What you should be doing is volume that's right for the stage and let the sound guy take it from there. So so I want to hold that. Just put that on the shelf. I don't, dis- the I don't is- disagree with you. Yeah. If you have a if you're doing front of house sound and everything's going into that, then sure. Absolutely. You, you, you have to factor that into what you're thinking about. Yes, of course. But but and my point still stands. 
I've been on stage with people that time and again, sometimes just show up and they're, you know, whatever it is, their instrument sounds exactly the same. But how do you know? No, it doesn't sound the same. It, they don't do any, they don't do anything differently to it from room to room. And that's That's subjective decision that every, that every musician is making that from the stage, this is enough for this room. Yep. That that's an impossible judgment to act, act, accurately make right it's difficult yeah it's not impossible i mean experience can get you to the point where you you know you walk into a room and you know oh okay got it i i you know well, i need to roll i need to roll some of the 2k off of the guitars in this room because it, you know listen to it you clap your hands once and it's like oh okay great or like for me as a drummer uh I, I and i do that i walk into a room i clap i you know listen to how conversation sounds listen to how reflective it is and I'm constantly making mental notes. And for me as a drummer, what I'll do is pick different symbols depending on a room, darker or brighter. Mm. Uh, but I also, and this is only something I've learned in the last couple of years, playing with other drummers where I noticed, you know, that maybe their snare drum sounded better in that room uh, than mine. And then I go up and listen to the drum. And it's like, wow, that sounds like crap. And I realized that adjusting the snare tension can make a huge difference between having a snare that just like cracks and is explosive and like over dominating and the same drum without even retuning it. You just loosen the snares on it and it suddenly becomes this mellow thing that, that sounds the way you want it to in that room. So it's, it's a constant learning thing. Uh, it's a constant learning thing. Let, let me get yep. back to my point. So, yeah, so drummer is oh, setting yeah. up, yep. he's hitting his drums. He's filling, he's filling the space with drum sound. Sure. And they're so subjective. This is enough. This is too much. Although, although my observation in this particular case was it was at X and it just went from X to, and X was actually a little too loud to start. And it went from X to X plus as the night went on, um, on stage. Well, actually, why don't we start here? The goal of good, of good stage sound of good stage volume Let's not assume in ears. Let's just assume, you know, sure. fairly basic setup. Yeah. And, it, you know, I, I would imagine that not bad advice is get underneath the vocals. Everybody. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, that's um, it, that it should be the fact that you I mean, I laughed because it, like the fact that you have to say it, um, it, it shouldn't even have to be said. Right. It, it, it shouldn't have to be said, but even in, in the house rockers and, here, and let, let me just tell you, that there's a couple of different personality types that take part in this. Right. So there's there's the guy who's like, it's going to be loud. So I'm going to make sure I get mine, whatever it takes. So I'm going to make sure I'm taken care of. So there's sure. that guy who's like, then there's the guy who's like, I'm not going to be part of the problem. I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to play really low hopefully get some in my monitor, but I'm not going to add to the, to the to volume escalation. The wash, right. Yeah. To the wash. So, you know, there's that, there's that personality. And there's just a whole bunch of people who are just kind of, you know, kind of clueless that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just do what I can. Right. All the stuff that we talk about, that's, you know, really obvious, you know, a bass player standing six inches from his cabinet. That's, that's pointed at the back of his legs you know, he has no idea how much volume he's putting out. There's just no way That's he true. can yeah, accurately right. hear. Same, same, right? same with the guitar. Same player. for a guitar. Yep. Absolutely. Totally. Right. Yep. You know, I know that my horn guys, you know, that's a very, um, you know, the physicality of, of creating volume is the, probably more draining on the horn guys more than almost everyone except for a singer. Right. So if a singer has to use physicality to get volume on a constant basis, he's just going to blow himself out. Right. That's just the way it's going to be. Right. Same with the horn. You know, if you have to blow, to just try and hear yourself, you probably have lost all dynamics. You've probably lost all the toe stuff. Well, so that's it. Yeah. If you're starting at double forte just to get a baseline, you can't go anywhere from there. You, you, there's no nuance left for the performance. And also, you, you know, depending on your stamina, you're not going to make it. So, yeah. And I also find that once the problem has happened, a leader just saying everybody turned down rarely solves the problem. The mess, the mess has been created. You need, and- you need, um, it, I've seen it work I, it, more often than not. Of course, I agree with you. It, it, it doesn't work. Somebody says, let's turn down. Everybody goes to their amp and like touches a knob or whatever. And, yeah. uh, you know, and then that's, then, then it's the same essentially, you, you know, but, uh, but I have experienced it where it's like, okay, wait a minute, you know, we're over the top here. Let's pull it back. But that usually needs to be more, 
there needs to be more detail in that conversation. And I, I think that's what's usually missing is when somebody says, let's pull it back. That that doesn't it's not really helpful. Right. Because it's like, well, wait a minute. Y you know, I haven't been able to hear all night. Uh, what's the point? Like, how are we going to make this work? So it, it generally needs to be a little more uh, a little more specific. Like, OK, look, guitars are maybe they're not too loud across the board. Maybe it's that you need to roll off some high end from the guitars. Right. It's somebody having the awareness to listen and say, what's the problem? Is it truly just too loud? And even then, is it that the drums are too loud or can't you hear the drums? Or is the guitar too loud? Right. I mean, is it, it and is it that you can't hear the vocals? Because oftentimes the comment from, you know, from the crowd or from someone that's not trained, the untrained ear is it's too loud. Right. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes what that means is I can't hear the vocals. And and depend and, and you can be playing very quietly and have people tell, tell you it's too loud because they can't hear the vocals. So if you can carve out some some of that vocal EQ range from the other instruments uh, or even goose the vocals, there have been many times where somebody comes up and says it's too loud. And what I do is I go to the board and I, you know, add three dB to the vocals and suddenly everybody's happy. Uh, mm. If you have the headroom to do that and you need to know whether you do, you know, based on how you sound checked and how you set up. But but a lot of times it's an EQ thing, right? You know, can you can you carve out a hole so that it, if you think about it, like when you're when you're mixing a record, right? It, it, even just doing it on, you know, GarageBand or whatever you do it at home, uh, you know, you don't just let every instrument have the full width of this frequency spectrum. You say, OK, you know, the bass is going to live here. The kick drum is going to live there. The, you know, this guitar is going to be here. This guitar is going to be there. And you're and you're carving out spaces in the EQ range. And then the vocals will be here and maybe the cymbals are above it. And and that's what makes it sound good. Um, and you need to do that same thing on stage, even if it means sacrificing what any one of those instruments would sound like completely on its own it's not being played on its own it's being played as part of this mix so let's be let's just be honest about that and carve that stuff out so that i mean that's a that kind of conversation you can't spend that long on stage but if you've got somebody that's that's aware and the people in the band trust that person either as a sound engineer or maybe a member of the band that's that's you know skilled in this it can be really helpful to say, OK, we got to pull it back. And like in general, we got to pull it back. But I think we need to pull this back more or, or, or adjust that differently. That's so that's kind of a sound engineering response to the problem, which, you know, is if you can have that, that makes a lot of sense. Or if right. someone in the band can serve right. that purpose. But let, let me let me flop a couple other things at mm -hmm. you. Again, one, the simplest thing is on stage get underneath the vocals. Everything's cued yes. off the vocals. Right? Yes. Oh, it did, without question. You got to be underneath totally. them. Does, yeah. Now, the rest doesn't matter. Right. If you can't do right. that. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot more as a drummer. Cause like you said, you're guilty. I'm guilty. I, I have a friend who is a pro uh, touring sound guy. He's done sound for Queensryche, Marilyn Manson, Def yeah. Leppard, Shakira, you know, my friend Brad. I do. Yeah. And, and you know, I asked, I've had this conversation with him. He says, well, the loudest acoustic thing on stage is the drums. Everything is tuned around that. So I just want you to take me through. So like I said, I'm observing my friend who played with me the other night, good drummer, you know, but I, that assumption he made when it was just him hitting his drums, when nothing else was being made seemed to be the same assumption about how hard he hit plus and, but he got a little louder as the night went on. But I would just want to ask you as a drummer, you know that you're the loudest thing on stage. Right. I certainly what, can be. Yes, that's right. Without without a whole lot of work. That's right. And and even further, you put in ears in. So you're not entirely aware of what's going on on stage. How do you know you're hitting hard enough or too hard? Yep. So generally, uh, unless I have some other reason that I know that I'll I'll know, I play the first song either without ears in at all. If, if the scenario is such that you can do that or certainly with one of them out for exactly that reason. And maybe, maybe I can get away with just the first verse, but, um, but I need to hear like exactly what you said. Do, can, regardless of whether or not I'm wearing in ears, are the vocals present on stage? Is there a mix on stage that's musical, right? Is it, 
And I don't need to hear my drums as the loudest thing because I know that they're louder, you know, five feet away in part of the mix than they are for me. So I don't like need to wail on them. And I also know that if I don't if I don't have ears in throughout the night, my you know high end hearing is going to be reduced. So you've mm. got to you've got to be really aware of that up front. And and what I do is as I'm playing, and I and I don't always get this right. By the way, like I said, I'm I you know I I preface this by saying I'm guilty, but I try to be really aware of okay, what does this feel like right now? And then I check in with myself, you know, a few times throughout the night. Sometimes, you know, we come out of a chorus where things are, are pretty heavy or something. And it's like we come back to a verse. All right, wait a minute. Return to what it felt like in the first song. It, you know, what's that feel? How does the stick feel in your hand? You know, how hard, how, how much are you, am I winding up on hitting the snare versus, you know, kind of coming in softly on it. And every stage kind of has different forgiveness levels for that. So, so I, but I'm, but I'm also usually the sound guy, right? So mm. I, I'm, I'm hyper aware of the fact that I'm serving two purposes, right? I want everybody on stage to, to, and, and in the crowd to hear things well. So I've tuned the monitors. I'm listening for that. It's not just, I'm listening to how do the drums fit into the mix? I'm listening to the entire mix because I know if something goes wrong, you know, I'm the point of contact for that. Uh, but that's that served me very well because I'm I I generally uh, am able to you know not overplay. It's I I don't get it right all the time. And and as the night goes on, my hands loosen up, and what felt you know it, what feels the same in in the first song of the second set is very different than what it felt like at the first song of the first set. My hands are warm, they're loose. You know I'm going to be hitting harder, and it's hard. Yeah, but you you have to listen. And and like you said, the vocals are a great barometer. If you can't hear the vocals and there's some reason that and, and unless there's some reason you shouldn't be able to. Like if I'm in a, behind a drum shield or something, right? And there's no monitor wedge in there. Well, then I'm just on my ears and whatever, you know, but generally there's a, right. a sound engineer. But yeah, you just I have to listen. Just like well, let's take anybody, it, anybody else does. Yeah. Right. Let's take it in a different direction. So, in a band that is endemically too loud. Yep. It's now a social thing, right? It's now a, I know you say you're going to turn down, but you're not going to turn down, right? So I'm going to make sure I can hear mine, right? It becomes yes. that type of thing. Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, can you deconstruct that? And almost to a point where you're almost used to that's what your stage vibe is. I mean, it, it, there's almost a level of comfort to that, right? Like going back, once you've for years been you know, behaving badly. Those are really hard habits to break, aren't they? Oh, and it's, it's super uncomfortable. Um, it, it, if you, well, take a, a rock musician, right. Or a rock singer. And, and it, you can be an instrumentalist too. That's fine. But it, you take somebody who's used to singing in front of like a, you know, two guitar rock band where, you know, the stage volume, even for a well-behaved band is, is relatively, you know, dense and then put them in front of a crowd with an acoustic guitar and a, and a vocal mic and a vocal monitor, right? The same vocal monitor you use on stage with your with your rock band, you are going to feel naked, and you're probably not going to sing. You're not you're probably not going to project or dig in as much because it's like whoa, everything's so exposed. Mm. And and that and that to 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 this to a different degree, the same thing can happen when you uh, when you you know take an entire band and and begin to retrain. Right. It's all of a sudden it's like, whoa, we can't hide in the wash anymore. Right. And yeah. retrain is really the right. You're really retraining your brain. Yeah. As to what the experience of playing music is. Right. It's totally it. it. And it's no different. I think it's no different than, you know, retraining your brain to become used to wearing like in ears. It's the same thing. Right. You just here's this thing that I know. And now I don't have that anymore. It, you know, call it a crutch or just, it's just comfort. It's not a crutch. It's just what you're used to. And now that's yep. gone. It's change. Yeah. So let's uh, look at the other perspective. It do you know bands? I know this happens quite a bit where they try to turn down in their amp, but then they say, well, give me more in my monitor. Yeah. And it's really the same amount of volume that's, that's on the stage, right? Whether it's coming out from behind you in front of you, it's still the same amount of volume. Well, but that can help front of house mix dramatically. Uh, because it, if it, monitors generally are, are very d directional speakers and and amps on stage are generally pretty directional, too. And amps are usually aimed at the crowd, whereas monitors are usually aimed at the performer. So uh, but 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 
once you have that certain level of cacophony on stage, that's when people start behaving badly to start Correct. correcting things. Yes. No, so, you know, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you've got to you've got to address it. You have to retrain. You're totally right. Yeah. Tell me about drummers. So so. It is acoustically the loudest. Can you play rock and roll soft? Can, I mean, like if you go into a room, you know, short of using bundles or brushes, is it all in the hands and in the discipline of the drummer or in the training of the drummer to be able to play in a room? You know, you're going to be in some rooms where you can't hit your drums so hard. Yep. Is this something that drummers learn that they're trained to do? Is it something that you learn out of necessity? How does a drummer be smart about about volume control? It's a hard thing. Um, it, it, it's certainly possible. There is a minimum volume level that is the product of the, the, the drums and the way they are tuned, the, the types of symbols that there are and the, the weight, uh, uh, and, and makeup of the drumstick, right? There, there is, there, there is, and I can, I could sit here and, and just like tap as lightly as possible on a snare drum with four different drumsticks and you get four different volumes because it's mm -hmm. part of the thing. So learning how that works and becoming aware of it and learning to use, you know, very lightweight sticks on those gigs where you have to be very lightweight, but you still want it to sound like somebody playing the drums with sticks, as opposed to, like you said, somebody playing with, with rods or with brushes, um, that's that's doable. You do have you can play high energy music um, without it being high volume. But All right, well, let me pause you right now. Yep. Do most drummers know that they have to master this skill? Um. Are most drummers self aware that you've come across that all volume pivots around what they do on stage? Not all drummers. No. Uh, the pros are. Yeah. And and I I use pros in in kind of the definition that the people in our Facebook group use the people that are yeah. you know show up and be, are responsible at at the gig yeah that's one of the that's one of the things about being responsible and and part of that is you know if you've got a especially if you get a front of house engineer and that person comes back and says dude less you give them less immediately and yeah. a lot less like yeah. they're not going to come up if they need you to just like lighten up a little bit man you know they're going to come back if it's a problem so it's right. like, okay but like, like cut it in half. And you know, interesting, this concept of retraining, it, you know, I, I am remembering playing a gig with a drummer who had really soft hands and, you know, yeah. was able to play. I think it might have been a wedding gig, right? Yeah. And, and that's it the was, thing is wedding gigs are often exactly what you said. Often. You've got to play low volume, high energy. Yeah, absolutely. And my recollection is, is that almost intuitively, once the band senses that the drummer won't be that problem, it's actually a lot easier to retrain. I so agree with that. I, yeah. Yeah. So, so once everybody realized it wasn't going to be this big fight and, you know, and there wasn't going to be this wash of, of sound to, to battle all night, I think nobody wants to be uncomfortably loud. You know, it's not fun for anybody. Right. Well, I, I think, it's I think it's a really lot of fun to play like, well, it's fun to be loud, loud if, yeah. but if you can hear, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's not right. fun when it's, you can't, you can't make out any, any difference in any no, of the instruments. Then right? it sucks. That's right. Then it sucks. Yeah. And you know, another thing about Led Zeppelin is like, you know, it was this three piece band. There was a lot of space, add yes. more pieces and the space goes away. Yep. There, there's a difference there. But my point being is that even musicians who I know to be loud, uh, once the drums, it's not, once it's clear, the drummer's going to be your friend on stage. Yeah. Uh, I think the retraining is a much easier thing. And so I guess the, the point of all this, you know, it really is, like I said, my friend is a pro sound guy. You, it, so much of the stage sound comes from, comes from the decisions that the drummer makes yep. from the moment he starts setting up his drums for a gig. It's true. Oh, without question. And, you, you know, like when I joined um, uh, Uptown Celebration and I knew that a lot of the stuff they were doing, especially the first set of the night, would be these, you know, sort of extremely restrained volume level cocktail. Hour. cocktail yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's cocktail hour, but then there's also like the first set of dancing. Is it, you know, the first half of that set? Sometimes you got to really ease people into it volume wise. And then, right. and, and, and then when, for me, my cue is when I feel the subs really starting to kick in with my, you know, when I hit my, my kick drum, that's when mm -hmm. I know that, that Dave, the sound guy has, has, you know, kind of taken the, the reins off. Time it's to like, enter phase two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, cool. Great. 
But what I do and what I did at the first gig, but I do it at almost every gig is I say, look, you know, it, if I'm too loud, tell me, you know, more than I do. I know that, you know, more than I do because you're out there and I'm here and tell me if I'm too loud. And if you have to tell me 10 times, please tell me 10 times. I'm not going to take offense at that. And I and then I always follow it up by saying, I hope you don't have to tell me 10 times. But <laughs> if you do, don't feel bad. Don't feel like it's wasted breath. It, you know, it. I am going to listen to you. And and just saying that uh, it helps a lot because, it, like you said, it it sends that message to everybody, not just the sound sound engineer that you're not the intention is not to be a problem. You might be a problem. And if there is a problem, well, we'll deal with it. You know, maybe the snare drum, like I said, you know, if the snare is too snappy or poppy or whatever. OK, well, let's fix that. If we can either swap out the drum or, you know, like I said, loosen the snares, whatever it is, you know, like I'm we're all on the same page here. We're all on the same team. The goal is the same. I, if I'm screwing it up, let me know. So and that I think that's helpful. It seems to be. I don't know. So if we were to kind of distill this down, drummer take responsibility and drive this ship. Yep. Everybody have a willingness to do things right. The, the, the goal is to get underneath the vocals, whatever, whatever level on stage, the vocals can be instrumentation on stage needs to be below that. Assuming again, you know, most people using traditional monitors, um, guitars I have, and bass. I have one thing to add for guitar players, a, a, a request is because we beat up on drummers. No, no, not at all. Um, it, the, 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 be willing and comfortable to have a very wide delta between your rhythm volume and your lead volume, because your lead volume should be as loud as the lead vocal, if not a little bit louder. Right. When you're taking a lead, that's that's the point of that. You are now the the you know, you're the vocalist via mm -hmm. your guitar. And I've played with a lot of guitar players that are like, oh, yeah, I got to turn down, turn down. And then when it's time to take a solo, you can't hear them. And it's like, well, I turned on my boost pedal. It's like, yeah, but that that's not enough. You got to like and it's a conversation I seem to have with a lot of guitar players. It The front of house guy, you shouldn't be relying on the front of house person to goose your level that much more during a solo just to make you heard. Yeah, that should that should be evident in your stage volume. And then and then whatever. Well, translation needs sort to of and out front. Yeah. For guitar players. Yes. But like, what about a sax player? Oh, that's different. That's different. Right. But a sax player is generally not playing a rhythm part underneath the vocals all night long. Right. I mean, uh, it, like when the sax, the, the, you, you're not going to have a horn player that's just playing all night. It, you know, it's right. a it's a it's an instrument that comes in and out. So that's a, it's a different function. Yeah. And the same for your keyboard players. Right. It, it you know, have the volume that you use for your comping and, and all of that. And then have make sure you, when you set up that you have an, enough headroom to really goose that thing and uh, and give yourself the presence that you'll need for a lead. And for guitar players and, and keyboard players, there's two reasons for that. Number one, you got to come out and it's got to you have to have a lead sound. Mm -hmm. But number two is, you know, when you're playing a rhythm part, you're often playing four or five or even six strings. When you're playing a lead part, you're often just playing one at a True. time. And, and yeah, you they, cut it through. makes less sound. It's like it's less string. So it makes less sound. So you have to be willing to goose your volume. I, you know, I find like three to one is the right thing. It should be your lead volume should be three times as loud as that same string played individually at your rhythm volume. I think that's probably that's really fair. So but I, but I would say this. It, uh a, a reasonably well-behaved guitar player will be like, again, I don't want to be part of the problem. People have sure, been yelling at me all night. I'm not going to you know, do this. What happens often, the band has to play. You there? Yeah, I'm here. You, you cut out on one word. You said the band has to play, and then I lost you. Well, and, and the point is, is what happens often is like in a really highly energetic passage, that yeah. might be a soul, but the whole band raises its volume, right? Correct. So the there's a certain level of discipline in being a sideman, you know, for whatever part of the song you're a sideman, an accompany, an accompanist. Yes. Accompanist. Accompanist. So, no, it's true. Yeah. I had a, when I was on the road with the clam bake, I remember, I don't know, about three weeks into the tour, we were chit chatting on the bus or whatever. And our sax player was like, so, Hey guys, can I ask you a favor? 
He's like, you know, all night long. And we were super disciplined with volume because we had to be because there was a, a banjo on stage that if that that was our our barometer, not the vocals, because the banjo would feedback before anything else. So we'd get the banjo set and then it was like, all right, get everybody get underneath it and you're good. And uh, he'd say, you know, we're so disciplined and so good on stage. He said, and then as soon as I take a sax solo, he's like, the band is just like, oh, cool, sax solo, and just like rages it up. And he's like, and I have nowhere to go. It's like, right. oh, yeah, that's a good point, man. Okay, sorry. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, volume is that many headed thing. It is, it's like individual responsibility, it's um, communication, it's, having pro sound where you sound good at moderate volumes. And like you said, also you, you do what you need to do because, you know, some of the endemic thinking would be like, it's a solo section and the guy's not pumping up and, you know, Oh, you know, people in the band kind of feel like, Oh, this part of the song should really drive the audience. And so they hit a little harder or turn up a little bit. bit. So it's really, it's, it's a team sport managing volume. It, it is. And you, and you really have to be willing to truly listen to what the other person is asking you and, and also be comfortable asking for that stuff. It, but if, like you said, I mean, if it becomes the dysfunctional family vibe of, well, you know, we, we all, we all just turn up and, and we're, you know, we're all misbehaved. That, that doesn't get anybody anywhere, but it's, but it's easy to fall into that trap really. And the funny thing about it is it is when it's perfect, it's so sublime. I mean, oh, it, and yeah. you'd think, you'd think that, that you'd be like, yes, let's do that again. <laughs> you know, let's go yeah. for that again. Yeah. But you kind of get to the next venue to different room and, you know, old I, habits kick I, in. And I don't, I, you're right. I, I'm not going to disagree with you in terms of like overall, but, but it is like fling is a very well behaved band sound wise. And it's, we like to be loud. I like, I always call it like that cushion of sound. If it's, if it's too quiet, you lack that cushion and things kind of feel mm -hmm. weird. But, but beyond that, we all really like when it sounds fantastic and we're all like on that same page from the moment the gig starts or from the moment we walk in the room, like how, what can we do in here to make sure we have great sound, not only for us, but for everybody in the room, but it starts with us. It's like, if we can make sure we have great sound on stage, then we know we can make it sound great in the room. Agreed. And, and it's, but it's, you know, it, the whole band is on that mission from moment one and everybody helps and works to kind of serve that mission. And it pays off. Like you said, when it, when it, when it works, it's like, Oh yeah, you want to do that every gig. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I wish everybody luck. I, I would say I've played in many, you know, my groups, I've played in other groups and the concept of onstage volume management is a constant. I played with guys who've been pros for many years yep. that are horrible about it. I've played with guys who are, you know, kind of just getting started who are way too shy about it. And you can't hear them. That's not either. No, it's. Uh oh, we've lost him, folks. Are we there? Paul has new Internet on order. This problem will be solved. But we heard most of it. Are you, did you did you make it back, Paul? I don't think he made it back. I don't know if he's going to make it back. This was a good discussion, though. I'm glad uh, you brought this one up, Paul, because it's uh, it's obviously something I feel very passionate about. And and it's something that we can all work together and and uh, and make it make it happen. So uh, send us your thoughts, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear from you. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Did I hear you make it back, Paul? I don't know. I mean, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, man. All Weird, right, baby. Sweet. What do you have to say? One last thing, man. Anything? Oh, I words know. Words of wisdom? Words of wisdom. Always. Always. You monitor sound. And before we.